actually, uh, we hold some of our uh, uh, operations here as far as if we do an exercise, if there's like a major earthquake, we have a, an EOC set up in the other room. So it ser serves as a dual, uh, dual purpose a little bit, uh, but it's a wonderful um, uh, asset to our community to have this building. So thank you, Susan. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, or introduce some of the police officers and chiefs and management that we have here today. Uh, first, we have Officer Tim Perry. He's in the corner. Uh, Detective Sergeant Ted Henderson. Sergeant Mike Sobeck, who is a, our traffic sergeant. Um, Tim DeGrano, Officer DeGrano, who uh, works in our crime prevention. Captain Steve Preco, who works in operations. And Chief Spagnoli. Um, also, I'd like to introduce uh, Jim Parola, uh, who's a city council member who is here today. Um, before we get started, again, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming um, to getting involved in, our, uh, in the community. Um, as you know, building the partnerships uh, with the community uh, makes us successful and makes the whole city successful. Um, so, you know, every time we have these community meetings, I just want to say thank you because you are the eyes and ears of the city. You have that vested interest. Um, again, I grew up here, so it's nice to see the community involvement and, and see that people care about their, uh, the cities that they live in. And, you know, I can assure you that the members of the San Leandro Police Department want to make sure that this city is safe for you. Um, before we get into any questions, um, I want to talk. Tim, do you want to discuss some of the uh, upcoming crime prevention information that you have? Sure. First of all, uh, in the, on the back table here, you can get it before you leave. You don't have to do it now. There's two of these uh, brochures, uh, some literature. One is titled Crime Prevention, and the other one is titled Neighborhood Watch. The Neighborhood Watch pamphlet, that pretty much so explains it all on how to get one started, what they mean, how to contact us. There's a lot of good stuff in here. They're very 1950-ish looking, but that's not a bad thing. They're very easy to read. Uh, some of the pictures, that's why I say they're 1950-ish. Some of the silhouettes they have on here are uh, like cartoon characters. But they're real good, and that's why we keep ordering these, because they, uh, they explain everything really well. Anything that I would come to your house and explain to you is in these brochures. So they're on the back table. Uh, take a couple of them if you want to. Take them back to your neighborhood watch groups. If you don't have one, I'm always available. I'll give you my card. In fact, I'll put them back on the table there. And you can call myself or my partner, Kerry Kovach and uh, we'll set up a time and a date to come out to your house or, or wherever your organization wants to meet and we'll take care of that for you, okay? Any questions about Neighborhood Watch right now? No, okay. Sometimes with these meetings, uh, those of you that have been here before, it's eight or 80, it just, it, you just never know. Some of these are very difficult when they're in the morning for folks to get to and that's understandable. Uh, the next one that we have in May will probably be in the evening uh, we just don't have uh, where we're going to have it yet uh, or uh, what the date will be. But uh, we'll get that out there. Typically, it's on our website. Uh, it's on our Facebook page. And we usually put it in the paper or two. So uh, it's always available. Okay? All right. We'll turn it over to uh, Chief Spagnoli. Okay. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, I think, uh, again, I want to echo what uh, Tim said. And thanks for coming out. Um, you know, I've been at, God, I've been probably at about a handful of meetings in the last week. Um, and uh, a lot of the questions and the concerns are uh, around, what do you think? What do you think the community is asking questions about? Or what do you have questions about? Anyone? Okay, so, Jim, you've been at some of those meetings. What are the questions that are coming up? Gee, uh, how about crime in my neighborhood? That's right. It's probably the number one thing we're hearing about crime and safety. We had a very large community meeting as a result of an assault that occurred um, in the area of Bridge Road. And um, I can tell you that as a result of that meeting, um, you know, one of the things that we communicate to the public is that um, this is a very safe community, despite the things that you're hearing and seeing around. Crime happens in our community, like it does in other communities, but it's how you respond to crime as a citizen, and it's also how the police department reacts to crime. And one of the things and ways we react to crime is uh, we're very proactive. We go out and um, proactively find people that are coming into the community. 
the second thing we do is we ask you as citizens to be more involved. More involved in helping us fight crime. So are you guys out of school today? Is that what you're doing? Okay. So what do you do when someone comes to your door that you don't know? This is a test. We call our parents. That's right. So as a kid, someone comes to the door that you don't know, you call your parents. And what do the parents do? When you, if someone comes to your door and they're trying to sell you something, what are you going to do? He comes to you and says, hey, there's someone at the door. They're holding some window washing stuff. I have a, I have a locked gate uh, with a deadbolt that I really like, and I keep that thing locked all the time. I don't open that gate. I, you know, I may open the door, but I don't, if I don't know you, uh, you don't have access to my house at all through that deadbolt. Um, and I also ask them, do you have a permit? Good. Do you have a permit? Uh, solicitor's permits are a big deal. If you're going to solicit in town, you need a permit. If you don't have a permit, call the police department. We want to come out and make contact with those that are um, soliciting without a permit. You know, I really think gone are the days, no matter where you live, gone are the days where you can leave uh, your, your home unlocked all day long. Um, and I've shared with other people, I've been a victim <laughs> of a residential burglary uh, because uh, someone took the locks off our windows, um, not me, the other person living in my house, um, doing a little home project, <laughs> right? Um, why a home project takes two years, I have no idea. But. Uh, took the locks off the windows, and uh, we became a victim of a residential burglary. And uh, that really got me thinking, because for over 20 years I've been telling people, just lock your doors, you know, or you know, do something to protect yourself, and I didn't even do that myself. Um, if you can afford an alarm system, I think it's great. If you can't, I think it's okay, too. Just lock your doors when you leave. Almost every meeting I go to, there are people that still leave their house and don't lock their doors or lock their windows. Why you would go shopping at Safeway and not lock your windows I, I, or doors, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's a good um, thing to practice safety. And that's going back to um, being safe in this community is a partnership. And we need you to, you to participate into that. And so the piece uh, that I hope that you take from today is that um, you need to be a partner in, you know, making sure that you're aware what's going on in your neighborhood, making sure you lock your doors and lock your windows, um, and don't become a victim of crime. Because once we get that out in the community, people stop coming when they can't find victims of crime. So I think that a lot of it is um, doing, uh, making yourself safe as well. So uh, when you're walking around town, how many uh, people see people walking around town on their phone. In fact, they're crossing the street on the phone, right? Not paying attention. So if I'm a crook and I want your phone and you're not paying attention, what, what do you think I'm going to do? Who am I going to pick? Am I going to pick the person that's walking to their car with their keys out, getting ready to go into their car? Or am I going to pick the person that's not paying attention, looking on their phone, you know, in the middle of the night? Who you're going to pick? You're going to pick that person that's not paying attention. So do things like that. It's simple things that you can really do um, to make yourself safe. Yeah. Um, and I did two things at home. I made the decision to go for the big bucks and had an alarm system put in. Um, at, and actually, it's an alarm system that can be um, added to later on uh, for one of those personal alarms yeah. as I get older and preparing for you know, the next 20 years, uh, I wanted to make sure I could do that. And the other was probably a 10 cent thing that I did. And on my keys, my house key has now a little red thing on it. When I get out of my car, I lock my, my car, and if I'm headed into the house, it's, I'm, I'm not looking for my key anymore. And I think it was something that was said at one of these meetings. Right. That got me thinking, and I was going through Osh, and there are these little, key things, and I thought, well, that makes good sense. The keys all look alike. My eyes are not getting any better. <laughs> I'm sure it, it only cost about 10 cents. Not anything near the alarm system, but um, I actually feel better, and I think I'm more secure. I, I'm not looking like, down again, which key do I have? Right. I'm making myself available for any sort of crime. Right. 
You know, um, we haven't had one for a while, but, you know, occasionally we might get some sort of a home robbery um, and somebody that was followed from somewhere. If you're driving from Safeway or from the mall and you're driving home and someone's following you, right, um, you would know that if you were paying attention. You would know somebody following you if you're paying attention. But if you're listening to the stereo and talking on the phone, hands-free, I'm sure, um, and not paying attention, you probably wouldn't know that somebody would be following you. Um, and so, you know, when, again, to not make yourself a victim, you see someone following you, where should you go? Police station. Drive to the police station. And then you sit out front and you honk your horn. Exactly. And somebody comes. That's right. That's right. They but came right away. That happened to me. So it did. And so that's, a, that's an easy example of, um, you know, how not to make yourself a victim. You know, the other thing is um, what we're doing right now is um, traffic safety is pretty important. How many people have a cell phone? How many people have a cell phone in here? All right. How many people use hands-free while they're driving? Okay. I'm going to have Sergeant Tom, Sobeck. You didn't raise your hand. <laughs> I just got ticketed. <laughs> we gave you a ticket? Oh, man. We, you I put it in the news. I deserved it, too. <laughs> <laughs> officer Humphreys, God bless him. Okay. <laughs> so that wasn't our officer. Was, that, no, it was, it, was, was it Humphreys? I, I thought it was his name. But it was, no, it was SLPD. It was SLPD? Oh, my God, what a bummer. It, well, it was completely stupid. And the worst part is, is you printed. But after the fact. Oh. After the fact. I already had the original. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to turn over um, some traffic laws that you can see that we're doing some enforcement on. Just got an email this weekend about, um, hey, I got a red light ticket violation. And I turned, I was the one that turned right. I did not go through the red light. Um, and I think um, Sergeant Sobeck will tell you um, how dangerous that is and sort of what to pay attention to on traffic safety in town. But we are giving tickets for cell phones. So, um, no, use your hands free. Uh, the California Highway Patrol has asked um, every city in the state uh, to uh, be a part of Distracted Driver Awareness Month. Uh, April is Distracted Driver Awareness Month. So what San Leandro is doing is uh, looking out for people who are driving. Uh, I guess the CHP is calling them uh, zombies uh, because when you are distracted, uh, you are not paying attention to the roadway and uh, bad things happen to, uh, to people um, when they are distracted while they're driving. People, they're, you get so comfortable in driving your car every day that you forget how much of a liability that car is. Um, it is as dangerous as a loaded weapon. Um, you, have a, you have a huge liability driving a vehicle and, and we do it so much and so often that we forget. And one of the things that we do when we stop people uh, for, uh, for running a red light or uh, not stopping completely at a stop sign. We call them Hollywood stops. Um, people get so mad at us because they don't believe that they're doing anything wrong because they do it the same way every single day. They think that they stop. They think that they come to a complete stop. They think that they look before they continue on and they do not do that. Um, you could sit at a stop uh, intersection with me and watch how many cars actually violate the law. We don't have enough cops to stop the people that violate the law and traffic uh, intersections. Um, it's because we just don't realize how bad of drivers we are. Um, and this month, especially now with the, uh, uh, the advent of cell phones, um, it has gotten a lot worse. We do so many things, we multitask in our lives now, uh, that we think that we can do that when we're inside, a, uh, inside of a, a, a car. And um, you just can't do that. Uh, there's some statistics out there uh, I, wish I, I wish I had with me, but so you know, it doesn't have to be a, a cell phone that distracts you from driving. Putting on makeup, you can get a citation for putting on makeup while you're driving. Um, you can get a citation for eating a hamburger while you're driving. It doesn't have to be a cell phone. If you are driving and your hands are doing something other than driving the vehicle, and we feel that we can articulate that you are distracted while you're driving, you can get a citation for it. So uh, people have this misconception that it's just about cell phones. 
and it's not. Uh, some people have iPads now that they put on their windows. Uh, there's a company now that uh, has, a, has a, a piece of equipment that allows you to put the suction cup on the windshield of your vehicle. If you do that, you can get a citation for it because it blocks your view uh, of your windshield. Um, the company knows that. It was interesting. I saw it on the news the other day. And uh, they realized that they made a big mistake with this uh, piece of equipment. But uh, the guy didn't want to admit that it was a distraction to, uh, to have that on their windshield. But you know, the size of iPads. Uh, you can't have anything technically dangling from your <coughs> rearview mirror. If it's, a, if, it, if it's on your rearview mirror, it's a distraction. Mike, if you have a GPS or something similar like that, a hands-free device, where can you put it? On yeah, what we suggest is putting it uh, right on the lower left-hand side of your windshield if you can, or the best part is somewhere in the dash area um, of, your, of your car um, where it's not, it's not blocking your windshield. But uh, um, we have uh, kind of been lenient on those small GPS devices that you can use. Um, uh, but uh, technically, anything on your windshield is uh, is a violation. You can get a citation for it. Rearview mirrors. What's that? Rearview mirrors. Oh, rearview mirrors too. Yeah. So, um, yes, sir. What I do with my GPS goes out of uh, line. I start on the wrong side. It's safe place. Right. Reprogramming. Right. Yeah. Oh, people will do it while they're driving. while they're driving. Yeah. People will do it while they're driving. Yeah. Just so, 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 so you're aware, so just to let you know, again, this month in particular, and we, we, will, we will be uh, diligent throughout uh, the whole year, uh, but this month in particular is Distracted Driver Awareness Month, and at least my traffic officers who are re solely responsible for the traffic violations in the city and the, and the accidents will be out there looking specifically for that. They're going to spend their time doing more of that than they are uh, probably speeding with the radar guns and and uh, all the other traffic violations because we're going to try to uh, saturate areas and, and just work on that issue alone for this month uh, and in cooperation with the California Highway Patrol. Last Tuesday uh, was the kind of kickoff day for, for this campaign and uh, San Leandro alone, just in San Leandro alone, uh, we had 60 violations. In one day, in one day, yeah. Is the Bluetooth okay? Too? Bluetooth is okay as long as you have it in your ear, and and there you may be a, no. there, there may be there may be a day because there are statistics that show while you're talking to somebody on the phone, you are distracted in and of itself uh, because your mind is thinking of something completely different than driving. Uh, that law hasn't come out yet, but. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen because there's a lot of legislators, uh, legislators out there that uh, need to talk on their phones to and from the Capitol. So, um, you know, that always kind of coincides, huh, Jim? <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, yeah, as long as you have a Bluetooth, your hands should be on the wheel, um, and uh, you should be concentrating on driving. Any other questions? All right, Any traffic-related questions? What is fines on things like that? About 286 bucks, something like that. For the first time. Uh -huh. Oh. Yeah. Certainly. <laughs> 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 yeah. And I think if you. Since I have my grandsons here, could you speak a little bit about passengers' behavior while you're driving? <laughs> well, passengers passenger should be sitting still and should not distract the drivers and be in their seatbelts. Um, if, uh, if you're really small, you should be in a car seat. And you should not be throwing anything around? Uh, no, you should not be throwing anything around. <laughs> the car is not a place to play. It's a place to get to and from. And you should listen to your grandma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, them, let them concentrate on driving. Right? Uh, There's a theme here today, if you, if, as you've seen, um, whether it be the chief talking about uh, being aware, um, Mike talking about traffic, 
Um, I know we've done, and Tim's and, and the crime prevention have done an excellent job about education. And that's what we're trying to do, and I think we've done a, a, a good job of it over the last year and a half, is really trying to educate you about um, you know, how to not to be a victim of a burglary. I know I've put out several press releases uh, regarding how not to be a victim of a street robbery during the Christmas season or in general. Uh, we've done one. Uh, we had a community meeting down at the Marina Community Center regarding burglaries and how not to be a victim of a burglary. Um, we've talked about uh, being alert in your neighborhoods, um, being good neighbors, looking at the suspicious people walking down the street, giving us a phone call. Uh, we've discussed um, how the people that are doing these clandestine marijuana grows in their houses, what to look for. Um, Mike has gone out, and I'm sure, like we discussed on the avoid the 21, the key there is not to make any arrests, because if you educate the public not to, to drink and drive, you know, that's just going to make for a safer community. So we really want to educate you so you can educate your neighbors, and then your neighbors can educate their neighbors and pass that information on so the community as a whole, we can work in a collaborative effort to make sure that our city is as safe as possible. Um, and that is the ultimate goal. I mean, um, and I think Tim, Officer Perry, is a young officer who's very proactive. Um, you know, I used to take the stance of, you know what, I want to go out and deter crime, right? You want to drive around your neighborhoods. You, want to, you don't want crime to happen. So if you're driving around being a proactive police officer making stops, right, you're, you may be preventing, you know, if you make a little small arrest for someone who may have some drug paraphernalia on them, they may be, in a, that, might, that same suspect may be doing burglaries in your neighborhood. So the little smallest arrest can make a huge difference in our communities. So that's why we want to educate you to look, to call us when there's someone suspicious in your neighborhood so that we can help you not to be a victim. Is there any more questions? Yes. Yes. Um, I live up in the Assumption area there, just by the church. Yes. And there's a walkway in between um, you know, my house and the house and so anyway, there are kids always congregated there that I think they're catching school and doing and smoking other stuff that shouldn't be. And I've called the police a couple times, but that walkway has been a, a sore spot for our neighborhood. During the summer, it's nothing. But during the school time, there's a kind of, and we try to, we all try to call there. Yeah. And it's been, I don't know, I moved in the neighborhood after the walkway was already. That, that walkway's been there for years, yeah, yes. Yeah, but it's, um, increasingly, I noticed that during the school year, it's, it's more and more, and you shoot the kids. I used to have a dog, but he passed on, and they, they we used to stay there as much. Now that he's gone, there's no barking or anything, and so they're there. Yeah, and because it's out of sight, and what we can right. do is obviously, Tim, what beat are you working now? Three? Almost Beat one? Okay. What we can do is we can pass that, I'm sure it's during normal day hours, we can let our beat officer that knows that during those school, is it before school or even during school? During school and uh, after school, I guess they scram on them out. Yeah. I think they're ditching. They must be. We can patrol check that area, but obviously if you see a bunch of kids, give us a call. Obviously, calls for service and prioritizing the calls, you know, sometimes we may not to get a, be able to get an officer there immediately, but I'd say I would probably it'd be yeah, fair to say that we're going to get there someone uh, fairly quickly. Uh, and he says, Ooh, pretty strong. I could get woozy. Get woozy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Please give us a call because that's 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 not okay to do in our neighborhoods. Okay. Anybody else have some questions? Yes. Um, um, high schools. Yes. In, like, schools around here. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have like a, a single officer there, like patrolling for bullying? Patrolling for bullying. We have SROs that patrol our high school. Um, we don't have like at the grammar school at your age. We don't have officers there. Um, but we have educated, our, our educators are now um, well versed in bullying, and we now have a text to tip. So if you want to, if someone wants to uh, let us know that bullying is going on in school and they want to do it anonymously, um, they can. But let's say you were being bullied at school. I would hope 
that you have enough confidence that you would go tell someone, correct? Because that's not okay. And that's what we want to encourage. Um, we want to encourage you to be a leader, be, you know, stand up for yourself, and let someone know if that has ever happened. Um, there's a lot of different, in fact, I was uh, back in Washington, D.C. for three months from October through December, and I actually got to meet um, an individual there. She's a, a chief in um, the Seattle, Washington area, and she developed the whole state of Seattle's bullying curriculum. And I actually got to read a lot of what they're doing. Uh, that information uh, was actually passed on to uh, some of the school district here who was already implementing a bullying um, uh, process and how to combat it and to educate. <coughs> Again, education about bullying, knowing the signs of bullying, that's what we want to do uh, as a police department, and that's what your teachers are, uh, because that's, it's becoming a uh, very popular theme. Can I answer your question? Over here, Dick. Yes. So I live on Deal Avenue, right across from the street, or from a house that I'm pretty sure you guys know. Um, there was a major police action there probably about two months ago. Um, and I guess one of our neighbors came to the last uh, you know, coffee and was told that, you know, hold on, there was something going on. Can you kind of give us some information as to you know what's being done about that particular residence? Because it seems like you know, you guys it, show up. Is it on? Uh, it's, it's 576 D11. Is that the one? That's, yeah. Um, I, I know, and Ted I mean, can maybe I, come just, up here. Just to give you a little background, I live right across the street from that house. Uh -huh. My wife calls me at work one day saying, you know, there's police cars, guns drawn, they're barricaded in the street. I've got two girls under three years old. So I'm a little, you know, kind of worried about what's going on there. The owner doesn't live there. He's, you know, gone Section 8 to... Yeah. <clears throat> you know, kind of rent the house out. It seems like there's people going all times of the night. There's people stopping by for four or five minutes at a time and taking off. Um, um, you know, it, it yeah. seems like, you know... That we are familiar with that house. I can share in. Uh, Sergeant Henderson, in fact, I think was, I think he's the one who dealt with that situation okay. uh, at, the, at the house that day, and he can speak more about that. But... Um, there's a lot of different options. First of all, I, I, I'm pretty sure our beat officers know about that house. Plus, we have a, our TAC unit who handles specialized problems like that. That information will be passed on to them, and we can kind of make it a project and, and try well, to handle well, what, I mean, what can we do as, as neighbors? Because, I mean, we're, we're, we're done. I mean, in yeah. 2011, there were 15 calls, and they arranged everything from, you know, ascertain welfare to, you know, there was one in 2007, Luton, Civil City's Act, and every child under 14. I've got two girls that are three years old. That kind of worries me a little bit. So yeah. what can we do? You know, you mentioned earlier, you know, don't be a victim, report suspicious yeah. stuff. The entire neighborhood wants them gone. And okay. we talked to the landlord. Landlord seems to, you know, bury his head in the sand saying, well, I can't do anything if there's no problems. You know, we've got, you know, your guys' printout right here back from back to 2007. There's 40 incidents. So yeah. Well, and that's, that's the problem when you have a landlord sometimes that's not being responsible for their property. Um, but there's different ways we can handle that, obviously. Um, and I'll meet with you maybe after this and get some of that information. We'll pass that on to our street crimes unit. Um, and then what they typically do is they handle neighborhood problems or, or beat health problems. And they have the time to specifically target, um, you know, and kind of, you know, develop information that will hopefully lead you know, to getting rid of the problem. But unfortunately, I, with that particular resident, there's a lot of, I guess it's transient, not transient, but people coming and going that don't and, actually and live the problem, there. I mean, we, we know yeah. people that are registered to live there. They're very nice people. The problem is the people that come and go, they come for, you know, a couple of days. I mean, we're seeing strangers over there all the time. We're seeing, yeah. You know, I've known cars all the time. And, you know, that doesn't include, you know, people that show up for four or five minutes and somebody, you know, comes out, they do something. Uh -huh. I mean, I, you can guess what it is. I yeah. mean, I'm a bright guy. I'm pretty sure what it is. And then they leave. Yeah. So, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll pass that on to our street crimes and we can, we can handle that on an enforcement end. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll contact the property owner themselves and say, hey, listen. And I'll look into our code compliance also as well and see if we can kind of work that angle as well. But I'll let
Detective Henderson kind of talk about that incident so he can kind of educate you about that. <clears throat> the one particular incident that we uh, that you're talking about, uh, really, it had no um, impact, I guess, as far as the Stanley Edge community. It was an incident that happened in Oakland uh, where one of the residents were believed to be involved in a residential robbery. Okay. Uh, so that individual was taken into custody and it was learned that he actually, he wasn't involved in it whatsoever. He actually sold his car to and, one of the and, unknown and that, suspects. And that's what my wife had explained. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. But it, it, it's still a little bit unnerving when you get a phone call saying, Oh, absolutely. They the street off, you know, there's guns drawn, people are <clears throat> barricaded behind cars, you know, because if there's a shootout, my house is in the, is, I mean, they miss right. and there are bullets going in my front window. Yeah, I'm, I'm right next door. Right, I think and I remember seeing I, you out I was, there. I was there, I, right. I saw that. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that kind of a hazard is nice not to have to have in the neighborhood, and obviously you can't, you can't guarantee everything, uh, anything, you know, forever, anytime. You can't, I mean, that's not realistic. <coughs> but with this particular house has been a, a pretty consistent problem. I got a, a printout uh, from your department, which I appreciate very much, which shows the number of incidents over the last couple of years, and um, wow. It's uh, it's amazing. It's just phenomenal. So, yeah. You know, I uh, I lived on I live on a street and the, the street the house right across the street from me had the same exact problems as the last house that I've been at the last week. Right. Um, it's a problem, unfortunately, that takes time to get rid of. Right. You know, we have to attack it, attack it, attack it all the time. Right. Call all the time, right. every single time. Do not think about I'm, I'm being a, a nuisance or anything like that. Call, call, call. Yeah, if we see a car, uh, a yeah. strange car, then right it's very hard. Car, it's it's like very, it. very hard. There's no, <clears throat> there's no two ways about it. It's very hard to get rid of people. In, in my, on my street, we finally, uh, finally happened, uh, and a lot of have to do with that they own the house, which was great. Right. Um, but it finally was cleared up. But it took probably for us for us about five years right. of, of people selling. And, uh, and we, no we had the impression that <clears throat> uh, the folks had enough information so that something actually was going to happen in the, in the middle of February. Yeah. But uh, for one reason or another, it didn't, and that's what These guys, these guys are, are, are old cons. They're right. very, very smart. Right. Uh, to get into that house for us uh, in an undercover capacity would be very tough. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, but anyway, I, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to relate my feelings, even with a police yeah, officer right. across the street from a house that is <coughs> very bad, it takes a lot of time. But it takes everybody to call in the neighborhood. We had we had neighborhood watch programs. Uh, people wanted to know what they did because they were very respectful to me. Right. I used to drive, drive my motorcycle home, but they, they did very bad things and treated their neighbors, the other neighbors, very poorly. Uh, but they were finally gone, and uh, uh, they had to actually tear down that house and build a new one because of, of the destruction inside that house was unlivable for anybody else to come in. And I, I've been in that house, it's not that, that bad, but it, it not really yet. needs to be cleaned up. But, um, just be patient, but we have it, and I know we probably have one of the best uh, vice narcotics uh, cops, supervisors in, in the area that he actually knows about it. I didn't want to just mess it up. I just wanted to show my experience. Yeah, appreciate, it. Like that. appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and so we've also contacted um, some housing authorities through Section 8 about that residence, but again, it, it's just something we can't just turn the light switch on and sure. and, and the problem no, goes away. I, but I was, we, it is it is been dealt with, but a lot of those problems again, they're, they'll slow down for a while. It's not a problem, and then all of a sudden, there's more activity. Um, so please call us. And the other um, thing I noticed, and I'm not sure how to deal with this. I was actually in the house the other day. Um, Helping them out with some stuff, and I there was a very very smell, a strong smell of, of pot, mm -hmm. and which is whatever. Except there's a, there's a little gal in that house. Yeah, you know, there's, 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 there's foster children old. in the house that are young. Right, and are they the fact are they foster she, parents? Uh, yes, right. And the fact that this little gal is having to be exposed to to this kind of air pollution doesn't seem like a, an appropriate thing. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, and that and that's good to know because that's another angle that we can work right. uh, with child protective okay. services. Okay, we'll talk about that more later. Okay, okay. Uh, anybody else? Yes. Um, how many times? 
But how many times a month do you use the diet? About how many times a month do we use the diet? If that's Ted being an ex canine handler, I, I don't. I've never worked a canine, but uh, we use them fairly often. Uh, anytime you get an alarm or uh, a burglary call or we're looking for someone, we'll use the dogs if they're available. So when you were a canine handler, Ted, how many times a month did you use your dog? Uh, I mean, you use, they use them all the time. I mean, they're like a partner. So, but as far as like searching, sometimes, you know, you may go a day where you don't do a search, but then you might do a day where you do five searches. Um, but those dogs, um, they are actually, they're like another police officer in your car, so to speak, for the canine handler. Um, so they do get used fairly often. It's just when I think, when you think of like using a canine as far as deploying them and being very active, but there's a lot of little, little things that these dogs do that help deter. Like when an officer, a canine officer goes on a walking stop, right? And I know if I get stopped by a canine officer and I have that dog barking in the back, if I had maybe something illegal on me, you know, I'm not going to run because I don't want the dog to come chase me down. So uh, they are a great deterrent. They're a great asset to the police department. Um, we recently got some equipment donated by the Broadmoor Homeowners Association. Uh, we had a uh, presentation last night that went very well. It was very well attended. And you were there last night? Was it pretty cool? Yeah, did you like to see the dog search? So they do that quite a bit. Um, and it's, you know, that, that leads to a lot of arrests and it leads to a safer community. Um, have you, has the department found anything um, more about the, um, the young women, um, the young business women, shall we say, on Victoria Court, on the circle, at Victoria's? Tim, are you familiar with that? I'm sorry, I missed a question. The Victoria Court? Victoria Court. The Victoria's on Victoria Court World and the, the young business women who are there. Have you found out anything more about them? Has there been any more activity? Which uh, because I see I, I sometimes see the young girls in the daytime now. Which block? Right on Victoria Court on the circle. Oh, on the circle. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're talking about in the corner in the businesses? Yes. The oh, Victoria's okay. Okay. Place, okay. The, the massage parlor. Yes. Um, that was uh, checked out. Yes. Uh, our vice unit did, did check that out yes. several months ago, as a matter of fact. Okay. Uh, when we first started receiving the first complaints, mm -hmm. uh, they went and they did check it out. Um, they did not make any arrests, um, but they are continuing to monitor. There are several uh, of these facilities yes. uh, in town. Uh, some, most are legit. Uh, they do what they do. They're licensed. They have a business mm -hmm. permit. Uh, these here, they continue to monitor. What happens, uh, her question is about, obviously, prostitution. And um, <clears throat> we get it in town, and it, it comes and it goes. Uh, what happens, uh, Jeff and I both worked in vice narcotics, and uh, sometimes when OPD uh, has a push on their end of town, we kind of get, they, they come this way. Uh, if the county does the same thing down here, then we get it, and it, it come, they come down this way to try and get, uh, escape all of that. So our unit does uh, go out and investigate it. Uh, they try and make the problem go away. Um, it's one of those issues that uh, obviously you're never going to, the world's oldest profession, I believe, is what they say. But uh, they, uh, we're never going to eliminate it. But in our town, that's our goal, uh, is to eliminate something like that. Now, then they go into businesses where they offer some other sort of service. So it's under that guise. But uh, we're on top of that as well. Um, so they did investigate it. I don't. I haven't heard anything lately. So this I, may be new. I know our street crime set out there. Uh, this was probably a couple months ago when we got some complaints. Now that I know it specifically, and I know they sat out there for multiple hours and stopped several individuals. They weren't able to make any arrest, uh, but uh, it, it has been aware of. In fact, um, uh, our vice, like Tim said, our vice officers have gone in undercover in there. No arrests were made at that time. My, my concerns are only because the two girls that I've seen during the day, um, although the older I get, the younger everybody else looks, <laughs> but they appeared to be teen. They were very, very too young. young. Way, way too young. And then, of course, yeah, I, I'm, my concern is the crime that is drawn to that. Not so much the activity itself, um, 
although I'm, I am concerned for the young girls. But <coughs> I, I keep, a, keep an eye out. This, this is a perfect example of why we say to call. Uh, I was at a meeting last week where a young lady came up to me. They're new to the area. They just bought their home, her husband and, and herself. And uh, they have two small children. And they were concerned about a house that was on, on their block as well. Uh, but they didn't want to call for fear of retaliation, but th that wasn't even the most of it. Their biggest fear was that the police officers in the department would feel that they were a nuisance, that they were that caller. Uh, here they go again, they're calling again. We never look at it that way. Um, I, I know that there's a misconception out there, that, and I always bring it up, and some of you, well, I think most of you remember it, bewitched, right? The television show, The Lady Live Across the Street, Ms. Kravitz. We like Mrs. Kravitz. We love Mrs. Kravitz. We can't catch them all the time unless you're out there looking out for us, right? So in, in, with this example here, when you see it, hey, are they just walking to school and they're just dressed what you would think is inappropriate, you know, to be out in the rain with uh, hardly anything on? Well, yeah, it could be, but let us be the ones to figure that one out. Because we can always contact these people and just figure out if it was legitimate or not legitimate. If it's not legitimate and we can't make an arrest or we can't make a case, at the very least, we get the bottom line information. So we get their name, their birth date, why they're there, uh, just a short story. And that way we know that they were there at that time. Now, if they don't live in the area in this, in this instance, and they're there three times, four times a week at that same time of day, okay, now we know that, I mean, why, why are you there? Other than waiting for the bus, because there's a bus stop there, right on Bancroft. Uh, but if they're not waiting for the bus and they're not going to work, to school, or coming from either one of those, then we know something's up and we'll take a harder look at it. So it, it is being dealt with. Um, it just, uh, you know, sometimes the wheels Don't turn a little slow. Take a little time. Yes. <clears throat> what happened to Officer Brian's previous dog that came in just less than a year ago? The previous dog? Yeah. So, um, yeah. We uh, worked with, uh, we buy our dogs. Um, on an annual or when the handler needs it and we match up uh, the dog to the handler and um, I, I've had experience in the past at other agencies and it's kind of like a marriage you know sometimes it doesn't work out it's like the dog sometimes it doesn't work out with the handler so uh, we pair people up and pairing a handler is a very is a process that um, and Ted actually could talk about the process of pairing you are a handler right yes. and so can you talk about how they pair a dog with a handler. It's not just, here's a dog and you get it. What do they do? Well, um, once you uh, make it into the canine unit, uh, you go out to the vendor and you actually get to look at several dogs. And uh, you're, 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 you're doing this with the help of probably another canine officer or the sergeant who's over the unit. And then once you choose your dog, you have to go through a month school with this dog, a 30-day school. And during that time, they want to make sure that you two can work together as a team. Uh, the dog doesn't have any obedience issues, whether it will um, bite the handler, for instance, is a, a huge red flag. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <that's> so, <laughs> right. And uh, if that kind of happens, uh, the dog is either removed from the handler, the handler gets another dog, uh, or they try to work through the problem if it's not that bad. But, it, but we, don't just, we just don't get a dog and we hit the street with it. Uh, there is an ongoing training process, which starts with this 30-day initial training period where this pairing is really examined closely. So the pairing in this case wasn't a good pairing, and so instead of trying to work it out, um, you know, dogs are expensive. They're $7,500, $10,000 that we spend on a dog, and if the pairing doesn't work in the first uh, 30, 60, 90 days, uh, we return the dog back and get another dog. So that's what we did in this case, is uh, the dog wasn't a match with the handler, and um, this is a, a previous canine handler from another agency. So Officer Brian uh, was a canine handler in Hayward, uh, so he has experience, and uh, the dog just wasn't a good match. Thanks. Sir. So I'm an apartment manager in Bacor Plaza. Mm -hmm. My problem is, I have two problems with uh, noise and sound. Apartment owner who doesn't care. Neighboring tenants keep calling the police for several years, nothing happened. And the police department help and talk to the owner. Often owner about this problem, getting rid of him. 
Yeah, and we find that that's it's kind of like the situation here when you have an owner that it's really disrespectful to the neighbors. It's difficult. I know working with the crime fee, Carrie does a wonderful job with the apartment, so she's a wonderful resource for you to look into because is your apartment complex, is it part of Carrie's crime free? Yes. Okay. Um, I think uh, the same problem with his property in Bankra. Mm -hmm. You know him. Right. Yeah. What happens is, uh, <clears throat> what the lieutenant talked about is, is, is a program called Crime Free, and it's for apartment communities. The teeth in the whole program is the, uh, the lease addendum. So what happens is you then sign a lease addendum to your current lease, stating that you're going to go by all the rules. They also do a background check on everyone. They don't pick and choose. They do a background check on everyone that's applying to live in this apartment. Some of these folks are under assistance, government assistance, to pay for their rent um, because they're needy and they, and, and they need the help. So what happens is they have to live under those rules as well. So if you fall afoul of the law or you get arrested or you get so many police calls for service to your apartment, uh, then you break the lease addendum and you can be evicted. This makes it a lot easier uh, for the property owners or the property management companies to evict these folks so that they don't become a problem. In the apartment, well, let me tell you this, we have 137 apartment communities in San Leandro. 137. San Ramon has 12. So a third of the population in San Leandro lives in an apartment community. We know, I grew up in an apartment, so I know. It's very transient, which means that these folks come in and they live in an apartment. There's no sense of real ownership with most of them because it's an apartment. And they may move on to something better later, or this is just until they, I don't know, get married or find a better job or what have you. But they don't stay very long, typically. You won't find somebody who's lived in an apartment, especially in San Leandro, uh, for more than maybe, you know, four or five years, maybe not even that, and then they're on to something else. They buy their own home or they move out of the area or something like that. So there's no real sense of ownership. This crime-free program puts that sense of ownership into the residents. So they feel like they belong to a community. And that's why we call it an apartment community, because it is. And let's face it, you live with a wall that's probably about that big next to the next person. So if your music is just a tad high, they're going to know it. People work from their homes now, whether it's an apartment or a house. People uh, have different shifts. They work, you know, like a police officer, a nurse, a doctor, uh, some folks that work in these big factories, they work shift work. So while they're sleeping during the day or, or in the evening because they got to go to work very early, you know, you may be trying to play your music. Well, we, we put a cap on that so that that doesn't happen. And everybody kind of learns to get together. Carrie runs a great program. And uh, as you folks know, uh, they have several meetings. You have to be certified. And once you are certified, then uh, the lease addendum goes into effect. Okay, any questions about that? I suppose sometimes maybe <laughs> you, uh, your biggest challenge might be with a property owner or a property management company cooperating with some of this because like with the fellow that owns the house next to me, uh, his big concern is, is whether or not he's getting that rent check every month. He doesn't really care whether we're unhappy or anybody else is happy. He's, he's, he's just concerned about his rent check, so he's not interested in having people move out and then having to worry about finding somebody else. You're, so. you're absolutely right. Uh, the bottom line is, and let's be honest, bottom line is money. Right. And uh, if the government is going to pay you so much money to have that open for folks that can't afford it, that's automatic. You're getting that, right. regardless. Right. Uh, what happens, and we don't force this on anyone, it's not something if you own so many units, you have to be part of the crime-free program. That, that's just not the case. We will offer it to you. It's a free program. We don't charge for it. Um, and once you're involved in that, Carrie will go out and she does everything, which includes things like what they call SEPTED, which is crime prevention through environmental design. We'll do that for you anyway. But during this program, in order to be certified, there are certain things that they have to do. Little things like the laundry room, which typically these apartment communities will have a, a common laundry room. It has to have a, lock, a self locking door. 
uh, because we know a lot of uh, shenanigans go on in these laundry rooms, just past practice. So the lighting, the shrubbery, any of the foliage actually, uh, the lighting outside, the lighting inside, each unit has to have certain things. And once those are all taken care of, and that's that's where some property managers and, and, uh, and uh, property owners, yeah. that's why they don't... They don't want to participate. Because it's a lot of money that they have to right. put out front. Right. But in the end, so you either pay now or pay later. Right. That's how it happens. Because if something does happen to someone, they get robbed or, God forbid, they get killed or hurt or, 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 you know, something in one of those laundry rooms or you don't have a gate that's locked around your pool if you have one. Right. 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 Think of the lawsuit. Oh, yeah. So you spend a little money beforehand to save yourself afterwards. Right. She has, I, I can't remember how many currently she has in the program, but when she first started, she, she was butting heads with a lot of the property management companies and property owners until it was fully explained. They went to the classes, they got certified, and now they're telling other property owners, you should do this. And one of the caveats is that your insurance company, once they know you are crime-free certified, some of the rates go down. Right. Yeah, they would. So that, that's a savings right there. But you are right. It, it, it's you know you can lead a horse to water. Is that what you're saying? Yes. I like that. I was late this morning because I was bringing my. I was supposed to be. Was duly noted. I, I put it back. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> I was bringing my uh, neighbor who was broken into on Evergreen. She had her uh, right where the walkway and the garage door kicked in, and then her husband was a, a, a former uh, sheriff because he was stolen, and she's all alone now. She's about closing the walkway. Of course, um, that's been there, like the officer said, a number of years. And the people from up above, they just to walk down through there and they go to the um, back park that's at the end of the block there. And But it's, um, it, is it still necessary today to still have that? She's, she's so fearful after she's broken in to, um, she calls me at like every little noise. I'm her neighbor on the other side of the wall. And she, I think she's about 80. Venus, I think of her last name. Venus White. But um, is, it, is there any way that the city thinks about closing that? Or you know, we worked on that um, and looked at that. And I have to tell you, is um, that is a, a thoroughfare, um, and it's a safety issue for kids. Because kids are coming and walking through there, and it's much safer for the kids to walk through there than around. So what we've done is a couple of things: is we've worked with Public Works to make sure it's um, litter-free and clean in that area continuously. Um, that includes litter and graffiti. Uh, the second thing we looked at is to make sure it's well lighted. So this, like any other area, like you said, that walkway has been there for many, many years, and the goal is to make it um, a safe walkway that people can walk in and out. So.